Hi class, how's everything? Um, so we are going to be going over chapter two, um, the European immigrants. So this chapter um, is going to detail some of the European immigrants coming uh, to the United States. Uh, and it is going to be a pretty wide breadth um, of ethnic groups uh, from Scandinavians to Germans to Irish. Um, you know, it, you name it. It's going to be a nice, healthy smattering of uh, multiple ethnicities um, uh, as we're kind of going through. Uh, and it's going to be a nice and interesting discussion of uh, European uh, immigration, some of the different reasons that they had to leave, and also uh, some of the cultural differences um, that these ethnic groups had to um, uh, go through and it's kind of ingrained in some of their uh, cultures uh, and so it's a it's an interesting chapter um, and some of the themes that we're going to be discussing today uh, are going to kind of reverberate through future chapters uh, so let's uh, let's start without any further ado so some questions to consider for today uh, did each European group see themselves as part of a giant migration wave or do they still retain their individual nationality and allegiance to their homelands? Essentially, how do they see their identity? So essentially, as folks are moving to the United States, uh, are they still retaining their original ethnic identity and ties? Uh, or perhaps is it some type of hybrid morphed uh, viewpoint? So uh, this kind of is going to feed into the narrative for the class of hyphen American. And what I mean by that is, are you Mexican American, Filipino American, Armenian American, Russian American, right? What have you? Uh, so is there some type of uh, mixture or hy hybrid nature to it? Uh, or, you know, is it or do some people just still say, Nope, I'm Mexican? Nope, I'm Russian, right? Even though they moved to the United States. So we can have a conversation about that. Uh, were some common adversities for number two? that many European groups face that push them to immigrate to the United States. Uh, so we will be talking about adversities, and this is perhaps one of the main reasons that many of these Europeans and other groups around the world, uh, later on during our Asia sections, we're going to be talking about uh, what was happening on, in uh, mainland China for Chinese immigrants to come as well. But adversity is one of the ultimate uh, catalysts for movement and change. And the reason for that is because if your life is going incredibly well, right, in your home country, wherever that is supposed to be, uh, you know, you do not want things to change, right? Like you're comfortable, you're making good money, you're living in a nice house, food is plentiful. What are the reasons for change? Uh, however, if, you know, if you're living in your country uh, and life is not as good as you are hoping it to be, money uh, and opportunity is not there food is short and especially during these days and uh and ages um let's say starvation could run rampant um, because there were food shortages um you know from whatever host of reasons uh you know it would be a catalyst to push you and your family to immigrate right to find a better life somewhere so we will definitely go through a few of those examples uh and number three we will review the story um, on pages 29 to 30 and discuss the story of this individual of uh, for just for short I call him uh, OP uh, so I don't mispronounce his name uh, and so how is this story of forced assimilation similar to modern examples of assimilation policies from local state or the federal level that we have today in the United States so uh, it is an interesting conversation to have uh, and good, interesting comparisons to make from these, uh, you know, kind of older examples uh, to the modern day. So let's continue and start. So Mr. OP, let me try to pronounce this because every single semester I try, uh, but I don't know, somehow it's just, it never works out. OP Kenan Kao, if I said that correctly, but OP for short. <laughs> so uh, Mr. OP. Uh, so, this is a fascinating story, and I love our 
uh, our textbook because in the very first pages of every single chapter, they kind of highlight an individual life and an individual story, right? And uh, for this one, uh, it is very interesting. So Mr. O.P. Uh, was around uh, with the Powhatan people uh, during the 16th century. Uh, and as the Spanish are going through uh, in various expeditions throughout North America, uh, they end up encountering the Powhatan people, right? The tribe uh, near Virginia. And they end up taking him hostage after some various skirmishes and take him and a few other hostages back to Mexico City um, when a Spanish family ended up uh, kind of taking him in. Now, in the due course of time, somebody eventually found out that he is of quote-unquote royal blood. He was the son of a chief, uh, and to be a son of a chief of, you know, a great, um, a great tribe is a great, you know, wonderful honor. And so, as soon as they found out he was the son of the chief, the Jesuit priests immediately sailed him over to Spain to uh, meet King Philip II in person and for King Philip II himself to actually convert him to Catholicism. Uh, this was a great honor, uh, something that was only reserved for the very uh, lucky and few and reserved. Um, and so the fact that he had this, this kind of special treatment uh, was a real pleasure um, in the eyes of right the Spanish, and so his new baptized name become uh, becomes Don Luis uh, de Velasco, <clears throat> and so uh, he essentially this is a story of forced assimilation. You capture somebody and you bring them back home, and you essentially force them to adhere to your new culture and language and tradition. So in all facets and sense of the words, uh, they tried to Spanishify him, if that's a word, um, or, you know, forcibly convert him to becoming a Spaniard. Uh, and so over the years, um, he had the best tutelage because he was under the wing of King Philip II. He had access to royal courts and libraries and interpreters, etc. And so he eventually returned to the Americas as a fully grown man to Havana, Cuba. Now, the main reason they sent him back to all of these colonies in the New World is because of his uh, language skills, right, in Native American tongue, in the Powhatan tongue, and his uh, knowledge of the local region. So they thought he would be of, you know, very useful, valuable, um, you know, uh, playing a critical role, right, uh, for the Spaniards, the Spaniards and the Spanish moving through North America for expansion and conversion. And so he was at this point in time, right, fully fledged man, fluent in Spanish, educated in the arts, an expert in cartography. For those of you who do not know what cartography is, is an expert of map making and reading maps. Uh, and he asked the governor of Cuba to organize an expedition to the James River to build a mission. Um, if any of you here in elementary school uh, ever had those kind of projects, they give you a mission project uh, as a kid. Uh, in which you p uh, get to pick a mission from California um, and make a little kind of mosaic for yourself, right? And do a little project. And so uh, these missions were uh, essentially small communities slash churches, right? Meant f to spread the word of God and to interact with local communities, right? There were little religious outposts uh, near these uh, settlements. And so uh, during one of the you know, not skirmishes, but one of the uh, voyages that they had inland. Uh, the Jesuit friars and soldiers and everyone kind of in the platoon, right, kind of moving forward, uh, they were relying on Don Luis uh, for the information of where to go. Now, he purposefully misguided them on their second voyage. The first one was not too uh, fruitful, right? Uh, and so they kind of ended up coming back. But on the second voyage, he uh, deliberately deceived them and ran away to his own people, the Powhatan people, uh, you know, the Powhatan tribe that he was forcibly removed from. And so together with his knowledge and 
you know, him rallying the Powhatan people, uh, they ambushed the Europeans in a bloody massacre. So once they ended up killing this expeditionary force, uh, they ended up going back to the Spanish settlement from, you know, where their home base was, uh, infiltrated it because he himself was a fully fledged Spaniard at this point, right? He could talk the talk and walk the walk and his clothing was all Spanish based. So you, he could probably go up just like a Trojan horse and say, I am a Spaniard. I am here to speak to, etc., etc." Once the gates were opened, the, uh, the tribesmen uh, stormed the fortifications and they personally, uh, uh, alongside with Don Luis, he personally hacked the Jesuits to death with his axe. Uh, and so in the end, in his uh, biography, uh, he was writing that he was sick of white people and he wanted to go home back to his ancestral homelands and uh, his lands. And so this is a story of forced assimilation um, and how it sometimes does not work, <laughs> right? If you could imagine you being forcibly removed uh, from your family and people after uh, some bloody encounters, perhaps some of his family members were killed before he was, uh, you know, dragged off to Mexico City and eventually to Spain. But he never forgot that mentality, right? The, the mental image of what they did to him. And so years later, once he came back and he was a fully fledged man, uh, he remembered that and boy, did he deliver some justice. Uh, and so we have various kind of, uh, you know, representations here, right, visually uh, of the interactions that these Europeans would have uh, with the Powhatan tribes uh, and the various uh, uh, communities. And the way that the Europeans liked to uh, represent them were, you know, half clothed, still having bows and arrows. On the left hand side in the back, if you can see, we have many, um, you know, kind of troops uh, going back and forth uh, where the Powhatan tribe uh, troops are, you know, kind of uh, fighting. Some of them are dying or fleeing. Right. Uh, we have the Europeans with their muskets. Right. And the kind of uh, big billows of smoke from firing the rifles uh, on the right hand side. We have what the Spaniards were best known for, which is religious conversion. Um, all of that iconography that you could see uh, with, you know, the priest holding up the, uh, you know, the gold cross of Jesus uh, and everyone else kind of, you know, just around them, uh, you know, listening to the words. Uh, but this is, I mean, hilarious on a number of levels, because in the if you could imagine in the introductory conversations between Jesuit priests um, who are trying to convert these people to Catholicism and the Native American tribes, the Powhatan people, you could imagine that they cannot speak each other's languages, right? And so even if maybe they could understand a little bit, uh, you know, the, the plenty of the Powhatan people were probably just, you know, listening to the Jesuit priest and Jesuit priest says, well, you have to believe in the man who lives upstairs. And they're like, what? Uh, and, you know, he's like, yes, there's a hell and a heaven and all this stuff. And they're probably just listening to him. Just like, OK, crazy. Uh, what kind of pipe are you smoking? Right. And then here on the right hand side, we see on the bottom. Right. One of the uh, Powhatan tribe uh, folks, uh, you know, uh, either playing or you know smoking on the pipe. Uh, and so it is an interesting, you know, kind of dynamic to view. Right. How well and successful were these possible conversions uh, toward Catholicism? And how much of it was kind of just a, you know, Spanish, uh, you know, mission or goal. Uh, yeah, time will tell. We keep consistently getting more historical feedback. Uh, European migrations to the U.S. So we're going to be looking at some various examples today. The English, the Scots, the Irish, the Germans, the Dutch, the French, the Scandinavians, just to name a few. And uh, Europe during these centuries was uh, extremely volatile. Uh, we ended up having uh, and seeing economic devastation, uh, famine, poverty, persecution, farming acquisitions, uh, smaller job opportunities, etc. So to live in Europe at the time was not the most glorious or fashionable thing for the average person, right? I cannot speak for the nobility at the time or the monarchs, but 
For the average person, any small deviation in the status quo, such as a famine, uh, it is going to push more people to migrate, right? And to leave their um, lands in order to search for a better life. And that's ultimately the goal here, right? For all of these people. They want to leave Europe in times of crisis to find a better life in the United States. And we are going to see that time and time again. And for this to be the um, initial birthplace uh, that would eventually become the uh, American dream, right, if you will. And so the United States over time uh, will receive hundreds of thousands and millions of immigrants, right, from around the world. Uh, Europe at that time, like we said in the 1800s, was called the Great Migration because we had um, millions and millions coming in. Um, but we also had um, folks from Central and South America, from Asia, from Japan, China, uh, Indochina, uh, Philippines, etc., uh, for some Canadian immigrants. So, you know, no matter where you're talking from, the 1800s was kind of this rallying cry, right, of people coming into the States uh, for work and for better opportunities. And two big points of entry on the uh, Pacific side and the Atlantic side of the U.S. were Angel Island and Ellis Island. Um, there would be two main uh, port settlements that would kind of work with all of these immigrants uh, and process their paperwork. Uh, and this is the day and time where it was very easy for folks to come in. All you do is kind of just sign your name and there you go. Welcome to the United States. Uh, much simpler than it is today, uh, but that it's always the case whenever a country or a new nation is hungry for uh, you know, people, right? They want to grow their population. They want to grow the country. Uh, and so, we're going to be looking at the European immigrants and some of the old immigrants, right, of Northern and Western Europe. And let's start off with the English. So arguably, England has had the greatest and long lasting impact onto the United States than any of these folks, because number one, we speak English. Number two, we used to be part of the, uh, the English crown under the Queen. Um, before the Revolutionary War, and many of the cultural and political and social values that we have have been laid down foundationally uh, and live on today through the English system. Uh, and so uh, they probably have the highest uh, pervasive amounts of, uh, you know, legacy that ha the United States lives on with today. But in the 17th century, 1600s, quiz for all of you. Uh, some of them, you know, were leaving England due to religious reasons. And it is not like it is today, where we have more and more people that let's say consider themselves atheist, right, or agnostic, uh, or what's the other one? Spiritual, right? I always I always find somebody at a bar um, that starts asking me about my horoscope, and my astrology sign. Uh, and then they're like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But I digress. But um, <clears throat> they were having intense religious debates because they heavily, heavily, heavily uh, believed in their you know, religious beliefs and you know, worship of God. But the way that they were worshiping God within the structure of the church and outside the church was of vital importance. So at this day and age, King Henry VIII for those of you who do not know King Henry VIII, he was uh, a you know uh, he was a big guy, uh, and he had trouble finding a male heir, or I should say, producing a male heir, and so he started to uh, divorce his wives because they could not provide him with a male legitimate heir, and so over time, um, he started getting into conflicts with the Pope, uh, and. The Pope kept telling him, listen, if you're going to be still part of the church, you cannot merely start divorcing your wives. That is not part of our religion. We do not sanction such a thing. And so he ended up just saying, OK, I'm out and started his own church, the Church of England. So he had a big falling out with the Pope. Uh, and so many Roman Catholics were very upset with King Henry VIII, both inside and outside of England 
because he was breaking relations with Rome. Now, you must put this into context of the time. For centuries in Europe, the church was the end all be all of uh, hierarchical structure and power. Europe at this time was coming out of uh, the Dark Ages, the middle, the medieval period slash the Renaissance. But, you know, even though new ideas were being incorporated into the social and religious and intellectual fabric, you know, for centuries, people were heavily worshiping, right? God and Jesus Christ under the guidance, uh, the guidance of the Pope. And so the fact that King Henry VIII so cavalierly broke away and created his own Church of England was seen as, you know, a great babam slap, right, towards the face of all of these worshipers. And so they were extremely unhappy with his liberal views on marriage. I can't imagine what the guy would have accomplished if he had access to modern Tinder. Wow. So, this is where we uh, get to see the Quakers. If anyone does not know of the secret of life, Quaker oats, it is a fantastic breakfast. I should I should make um, I should make sponsorships for my videos here. But Quaker oats in the morning, fantastic, great little meal. But we have Quakers here, the religious group uh, that rejected the political, social, and religious authority of England. Because once again, they were looking at all of this cr crazy chaos of King Henry VIII's uh, marital issues uh, and said, no, we don't really agree with what you're doing here. And so they branched off and said that they believe all human beings are equal. And that by discovering the inner light of God within yourself, you could enter heaven without any church intervention. And this was a very important uh, point. Because once again, for centuries, the church under the Pope was telling people that you cannot enter into heaven without our assistance. You must have the favor of the Pope, of the church, um, sometimes pay indulgences, but, you know, they were completely intertwined with your success or failure of getting into, you know, heaven. Uh, King Henry VIII with his Church of England was saying pretty much the same thing. And so the Quakers were so unhappy, they just essentially just pulled out of the game and said, we want to discover the truth of God within ourselves. We do not need you to interpret all of this religious, uh, you know, uh, you know, worship for us. We do not need an intermediary between ourselves and God. And their very famous leader, William Penn, uh, ended up spearheading some of their early works of theirs. And so they had a very, uh, and we'll see this later on too, but I love the Quakers because they had such a wonderful relationship with the Native Americans. Uh, they believed in freedom of worship, they believed in social pluralism, essentially having a diverse body of uh, people. They condemned all slavery and promoted fair treatment of Native Americans. So during this time, when all of these different European immigrants were coming towards the uh, towards the United States and the colonies and everything else, uh, and you know we're treating Native Americans as savages, we're treating anyone who is black as a uh, as an enslaved person slash a servant, right? William Penn and the Quakers were actually, you know, far ahead of the curve, right? They were so fair uh, amongst all of these different lines, which is very interesting to see. Uh, for those of you that have a couple of minutes of uh, time, I believe this video is three, four minutes long, something like that. Uh, please watch this early Quaker migration uh, video. It'll put some of all of this, what I'm saying, into context, uh, some nice visual cues uh, for you to, you know, look at. Uh, and so uh, pause the lecture here, open up Google Slides on a separate tab, uh, and play this video. Um, and then once you're done with the video, please come back um, and we can continue. Ah, Mr. William Penn here. 
uh, the leader of the Quakers. Um, he, ha he has uh, been living very healthily and heartily on plenty of Quaker oats. Um, and so he's trying to stock up on the spiritual energy. Um, but Mr. Uh, William uh, Penn was a very, uh, you know, a very intellectual individual. Uh, his heart was, you know, filled of gold, uh, perhaps. He was uh, practicing what he preached. And so as far as the, the history annals go, um, you know, the Quakers always have a, an, an interesting spot as far as the religious groups go, because they were so forward uh, in their ways of thinking uh, at the time. And let's analyze this painting, shall we? So in the, in the middle, a little bit towards the left, actually, if I can do my, uh, my pointer and annotation tools for my pointer here. So if you could see uh, William Penn over here, right, the leader of the Quakers, uh, he is obviously right trying to uh, delegate between uh, some of the Native American tribes and themselves. But what is important to see is the interaction between the Quakers and the Native Americans, right? Uh, because typically, let's say if we are looking, if you march into any museum with beautiful paintings of this time period and before, let's say if it's typically Spanish art, uh, the Spaniards would have these beautiful paintings, but the individual, let's say a conquistador, would be gloriously uh, bathed in blood, right? With his sword and his spear bloodied with the Native American enemies. And he is victoriously kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of standing over their bodies, right? And kind of just dominating them to the fullest extent possible. And so that's the typical European narrative, right, of uh, what I like to call the three G's, God, gold, and glory, right? Uh, and so that's kind of like the European expansionist model. Uh, we are doing this for God to convert the native populace. Uh, we want to extract as much resources as we can with the gold, and we want as much glory as possible because the more we conquer, the more glory I have for myself individually, but also for my home uh, nation, my home uh, empire or the monarchy. Uh, and so that's kind of the typical artwork. But here, as we can see, there no one's dead. Everyone is kind of peacefully coexisting. We see the Quakers, instead of standing above their enemies bathed in blood, we see they are actually kneeling down uh, onto the same level, right, as their Native American compatriots here. And they are actually giving gifts over here. They are not expecting gifts to be given to them. They are coming forth in peace to give gifts. And so this is a beautiful exchange between both groups, right? Showing an extra level of understanding, compassion, empathy, something we do not see in many other um, forms of art during this time for other you know, groups, such as, let's say, the Spanish. The Puritans. Now, another group within England that rejected the church, uh, and specifically they rejected the Church of England. So once King Henry VIII created his Church of England, we had the Puritans, which rejected this structure uh, and rejected free uh, will for predestination and thought that there is an inherent evil of human nature within all of us. And so they did not like the power structures at B within the Church of England. They uh, they did not like uh, predestination as an entire kind of narrative. And predestination is the, uh, it is the belief that once you are born, your fate of whether you're going to heaven or hell has already been predestined for you no matter what you do in your life. I am not a great fan of that theory personally, just because I always like to feel as though I can meaningfully change my life in one way or another, depending on what I want to do, right? Do a little community service, kind of take the marker towards being, um, you know, good and better. But 
Um, yeah, if there's absolutely no incentive for me to go up to heaven because I was predestined to go to hell. Light up, the, light up the cigars and let's go play poker all day and night, right? Um, or whatever your vice is. And so at this point in time, the Puritans were absolutely fed up. And they believed that America, being a fresh land of opportunity, was worth saving while England was spiritually lost. And so this was a very interesting dynamic uh, so they essentially said that England is a lost cause, but America is still a young, new nation, and we could potentially do some good here, right? It is not a lost cause. So they began to settle in Massachusetts in 1620 in Plymouth, as some of you might have remembered from your elementary school days. And later they started to obviously expand into other cities and states. But in spite of the religious differences, the English colonists shared a singular common perspective especially from the English side, that they were flexible and believed in innovation of their ideas to look beyond tradition and custom. And so this is something that I will say and repeat over and over throughout my lectures and throughout the chapters for this semester, because your historic past influences your cultural present. What the heck does that mean? For every single ethnic group that we are going to study in history here, their culture and their perspectives and beliefs and the way that they carry themselves are determined, uh, not entirely, but you know, a, a big percentage based off of their historic experiences. And so the historic experiences here with many of these English settlers are that there was a old traditional custom structure at play, which they did not agree with. And so they had to detach themselves from it, right? And be flexible and adapt and innovate into some new type of worship and belief. And going to the extreme here, leaving the, uh, you know, leaving their homelands entirely to settle somewhere else for freedom of worship. And so their flexibility here and in innovation is what saved them. And also they shared a different perspective um, in terms of class systems, which is very important as well. So Europe for generations at this point in time was developing the nobility class system. <clears throat> And Europe's rigid nobility class system did not allow for a lot of movement. If you were born a noble, congratulations, you're a noble. If you were born into uh, a tradesmith job, right, you're a blacksmith, that is what you are. If you were born a common peasant and serf on the land to toil and farm, that's what you are. And so there was not a lot of mobility. In the European system. There was some, definitely, right? Let's say if you were a wealthy merchant uh, and you encountered, uh, you know, a very handsome or beautiful member of a nobility family, but the dad and the uncle perhaps were drunkards, they gambled all, the, all of their wealth away, you as the rich merchant could come in and marry into the family. So the nobility family gains back some of the money that they lost, and you become a noble, right? And you inherit uh, their great name and their house seal and such. But obviously that did not happen uh, on a daily basis. And so compared to the American system, which is very fluid, and the American class system, which even at this time was not entirely, you know, evolved, but started to the fact that it was much more flexible with social mobility. So if you were to come to North America at this time into one of the early colonies and settlements, uh, you could be very flexible. You could gain an enormous amount of wealth. You could catapult yourself from being the lowest of the lowest class into a very wealthy merchant and perhaps governor of one of these territories. Uh, and so it was a completely different mindset, right? Moving between these two. 
And indentured servitude is something that we should discuss as well that the English brought over. Uh, although it would be for a temporary uh, stint of time, it would not be permanent, but indentured servitude uh, was still implemented for a number of years in which in which people would be transported to North America and essentially work for a family and for a master for X amount of years until their contract is up. Now, indentured servants came in a multitude of ways. Sometimes you would elect to enter into a contractual agreement with a company uh, in order to have free uh, transportation to the Americas and work here for however many years, two years, five years, 10, 15, whatever the contract states, uh, because you want to get here, right? You wanted the best, better opportunity. And upon completing that contract successfully, you would be released and you found yourself in the new world with your severance pay, with some money. Another aspect, another way that people came here with indentured servitude uh, was through crime. So let's say if you were running through the streets of Europe and you were not being the best self that you could be, uh, you were, you know, you were stealing, you were lying, you were gambling, etc. You get thrown in prison, and your jail sentence is I don't know twenty years for something, or for a number of convictions. Uh, and let's say they, you know, they have a contract with some of the companies in North America, whether they be plantations. Uh, or other businesses or endeavors. And so they say, we will, you will become an indentured servant to this household and this master. Uh, and let's say instead of 20 years, it will be a 10 year sentence uh, of service. And so some people would say yes to this and come over because they do not want to stay in jail for 20 years. Um, the trick here is that some masters were kind on some of these locations and some were absolutely brutal because if you were a brutal master, to your indentured servant, and this is white on white, right? So you can't even have uh, racial arguments here most of the time. But uh, they would be uh, particularly brutal because if you broke your contract and you ran away as an indentured servant, the contract is null and void. Uh, and so the master no longer has to pay you any type of severance upon the completion of your contract. And you not only go to jail, but they increase your sentence because you ran away. Uh, and so in the beginning, as people were migrating from Europe to the Americas, uh, this was, you know, a system that was working for a number of decades, but eventually started to die out a little bit more and more because these contracts were very difficult to fulfill. Uh, and many of the masters would uh, elect to be a little bit more nasty than usual because they did not want to pay the severance pay. Now, if you have a few minutes of extra time, stop the lecture here. And look at this indentured servitude uh, video, uh, which details, and it's only a couple of minutes long, uh, giving you an example of how life would be during this time. This here would be a typical contract uh, that you would have to agree to and sign. Um, detailing some of the uh, spec, you know, specifications of the contract and the agreement. Uh, so you would get uh, food, uh, you know, uh, drink, lodging, any necessities that must be provided to you, etc. Uh, and you would work for X amount of years. And upon release of uh, all of your duties and completion of them, right, you would shake hands and the parties would, uh, you know, will go their separate way. So a typical kind of contract that we can see here from a primary source document. Uh, and indenture servants really varied. They could put you to work out into the fields. They could put you to work out into uh, the households, um, either as cooks, cleaners, uh, babysitting the children, as we see here in one of these paintings. So uh, it really differed on the types of jobs, right, that they would have you to do. Uh, some were easier, some were more difficult. Uh, so it's a case by case basis. And so it really was a lottery. It was a gamble. Uh, you never knew what you were going to get. So if you elected yourself into indentured servitude from Europe at the time, you could be facing 10 or 15 years of hard labor out in the sun, or you could be, let's say, in the household, uh, dressed very prim and proper uh, and serving the household. So it really did depend. 
the Irish. So, let us look at the Irish, shall we? So, during the 1700s, we had approximately 300 plus thousand Irish folk leave uh, for the colonies. Due to a number of reasons, due to religious persecution, violence, and they also rejected the church hierarchies. Because, once again, religion was playing a huge role at this time. And they were not happy with what was going on. Amongst not being happy what was going on uh, with the church at the highest levels, with the Pope and the Vatican and all of that, uh, Ireland had a vicious religious war between the Irish Presbyterians and the Irish Catholics, which left approximately 600,000 dead. Uh, this was a bloody, bloody religious war. And so, you know, once they started to uh, slit each other's throats over the issue of, you know, religious worship, um, they had another terrible and unfortunate situation occur between 1815 and 1825, uh, which is the Great Famine. The entire country faced a Great Famine um, because all of their potato crops uh, ended up uh, getting this fungal disease. And so their food yields completely tanked, resulting for six years approximately um, of absolute, you know, just starvation. Uh, we had our, our estimates are around a million people starved to death. So in a relatively short amount of time, let's say in one generation, right, one and a half generations, we see approximately 1.6 to 2 million people dead, either from religious war or from famine and massive starvation. Uh, the Great Famine occurred for a, a singular reason, the fungal disease, but it also serves to prove as a lesson for future uh, farmers, right? Anybody who wants to plant crops, because the thing was, most of their crops were potatoes, and a singular strain of potatoes at that. And so that is a very dangerous thing because uh, I don't know if any of you uh, ever have plans on going toward business or if you or your family members uh, perhaps deal in stock trades, but one kind of critical rule is do not put all of your eggs into one basket. And so if all of your crops are the same and if a disease comes through here, uh, that means that pretty much all of your crop is going to be worthless. And so what people learned from this situation is that you now, it was a very wise and prudent thing to do, which was to diversify your yield. So let's say maybe 25% now of your entire crops would be potatoes, but then 25% would be tomatoes, 25% would be, I don't know, corn or wheat or whatever else, right? You kind of like, you diversify a little bit. So even if a fungal disease hits the potatoes, three-fourths of your food is still fine, right? Not 90 to 100% gone. Um, and so, yeah, for future generations, we definitely learned something. But for the time being, the Irish were suffering. And so we started to see hundreds of thousands of them come over to America because of this. And... As an ethnic group, they had an enormous strength in community. Uh, they retained much of their ethnic culture, uh, so much so that they attempted to transplant a lot of their villages into the New World, uh, bringing the same names, uh, street names, identities, languages, traditions, etc. And, you know, they also retained an enormous amount of group identity, right? They were the Irish. And whenever you met a fellow Irishman, uh, you were kind of at home. And so over time, of course, assimilation sets in and folks start to think of themselves more and more as Americans. Uh, and so, you know, even the Irish and everyone else um, sometimes cannot stop the inevitable overwashing wave, right, of Americanization. But that goes for any country. Now, if you have some time, please watch this video below here. It details some of the Irish uh, migrations and experiences in the Great Famine. A uh, great video to watch. So if you have the time, please stop the video now and go and watch it on the Google Slides. Here we would see um, some of these 
uh, migration transplants. And so you would uh, typically just carry as much as you could carry, uh, which is, you know, typically a large, you know, uh, traveling bag, a duffel bag, if you will, and you would move with your family uh, and have as much money on you as possible. Uh, and an important way to transport wealth also uh, is jewelry. Because you never know how the money and currency system is going to change your money, right? But if you are bringing valuables with you, pocket watches, uh, diamonds, rings, earrings, necklaces, things of that nature, um, that value pretty much holds up from one part of the world to another. And so I remember also when my family was moving here from uh, from Uzbekistan and the Soviet Union was falling apart uh, and we had in Uzbekistan at least uh, Muslim extremism uh, pop up. We had Russian mafias uh, kind of rampant everywhere and kidnapping little children and cutting off uh, hands and limbs and fingers and sending them back to families for money. Uh, all of this chaos and craziness was happening. But my family started to melt down any valuables we had and went to the local jeweler and we started to make jewelry, right? So we could actually wear some of our valuables and our wealth whenever we came over to the States. And so it is an you know, honorable age old tradition to do so. So if any of you ever find yourself in a tough situation or in a tough pinch uh, and the local currency is starting to devalue at an enormous rate, transfer everything into gold and silver and wear it on you, right? While you are moving and traveling. But here, as we can see, and I love showing these political cartoons because it dispels any, uh, let's say, modern recent trends or narratives of, let's say, well, anybody that is white has always had the best experience in America and in the Americas. Uh, this kind of dispels it because the Irish are obviously very, uh, you know, light skin. Uh, but because they are coming into the uh, colonies and into the United States on mass in massive numbers, we start to see something called nativist and I N A T I V I S T. So the nativist reactions begin, which is the local population ends up being resentful to the newcomers, whether they be immigrants or anything else, but especially in large numbers, they are very fearful of what could happen if all of these folks are let in. And so here on the left-hand side, we see um, these Irish uh, whiskey and this Jaeger beer, which is supposed to be an Irishman and a German, stealing the ballot box. And so what do you think this could mean, them stealing the ballot box? This means that people are concerned and worried that they are going to unjustly influence the American voting system. Where have you heard that before? <laughs> this is a modern um, trend as well. We are still talking about this, right? Uh, we're having our president, uh, Donald uh, Trump, always keep talking about, uh, let's say, uh, voting in the black community and the Hispanic community, uh, white America, etc. We have Biden trying to uh, gain and garner the favor of the Latino vote, the black vote. Uh, you know, any Democrats or left-leaning individuals too. Uh, so, you know, the voting aspect is always of crucial importance. But in terms of ethnicity and identity here, nativist reactions are always at play. So Donald Trump in the last number of years has always been beating the drum against uh, Mexicans, right? Saying they're, uh, they're murderers, they're rapists, moving into our country. We need to, you know, build that wall, as he says. Uh, and so this is an age old tactic and tradition being used in politics in America. It's not something new. On the right hand side, we have an image of the Irish Frankenstein. So if any of you have ever read uh, Frankenstein, uh, you know, Frankenstein, the scientist created his monster, uh, the creature. Uh, and so, you know, this is supposed to be the Irish kind of, you know, uh, monstrosity. As you can tell, uh, larger than a regular man, his limbs, uh, you know, twice the size. Uh, he has horns on his head, right? Because he's sort of a devilish. Uh, and so 
as we're starting to get more of these groups of people coming into uh, the United States, uh, we keep seeing these various nativist reactions. Um, and, you know, we keep seeing that, uh, you know, people are reacting negatively to it. So definitely something to consider. Ah, Andrew Carnegie. Um, perhaps, and this is a, you know, from the Scots. So it's not the Irish, it's not the English, but it's the Scots. So this is in northern, uh, northern England, right? Uh, some say the, the Canadians of the British Isles. Uh, but the Scots and uh, Andrew Carnegie was one of the most famous examples of this in the 1800s. And we're going to be talking about this a little bit more in our sections of westward expansion and industrialization. Uh, you know, but Andrew Carnegie was definitely a, a very famous figure and per perhaps one of the most famous uh, Scottish Americans during this period of time. So he was born in Scotland in 1835 um, towards the very tail end of uh, the textile industry. Textile industry means that you were making things by hand, right? But at this point in time, early factories and machinery were already starting to be made. And so his family's business was becoming obsolete and they were poor. And so his mother took him and his brother and they came to America for a better life. And so at the age of 12 and 13, he started to work his butt off and started to rise through the ranks, eventually uh, entering into the railroad industry. And then from the railroad industry, saved up enough money to buy his first steel mill. As soon as he got his first steel mill, he ended up buying all of pretty much all of the steel mills in America and had a monopoly on U.S. steel. Now, if you could imagine right before America truly starts building all of their railroads, cities, bridges, skyscrapers, all that would require steel, and you now have a monopoly on steel, this man was rich as a god. Uh, and at that time, his net worth was approximately four to $500 million, not adjusted for inflation. So in today's terms, it would just be billions upon billions of dollars. But he is the perfect quintessential example of him and his family coming to the United States because of dire circumstances pushing him and his family uh, to immigrate to the United States. And he you know, truly made something of himself, right? He became one of the wealthiest individuals in the world uh, and you know, strove towards his goals. Uh, if you have some time, please watch this video that I have uh, inputted here. Uh, this is a 10, uh, around a 10 plus minute uh, kind of uh, documentary kind of series uh, detailing some of his life in a uh, kind of short uh, summarized version, but very interesting to, uh, to watch. So if you want, stop the video here and then come back whenever you are ready. Here's Mr. Uh, Carnegie on the left hand side with his younger brother um, and then towards his later years on the right side. Now, something very interesting that I love about him is that towards the end of his life and after accumulating hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, he actually was the very first person that publicly, uh, as they, the new ultra elite, uh, he very publicly said that he was giving away his money. He was giving away 99% of his finances uh, towards charities uh, because he said the first half of a man's life should be earning money and the second half of a man's life should be giving it away. And so he, his money and his foundations and his trusts started to build uh, schools and especially libraries all throughout the United States because he said that early on as a child, the library was his favorite uh, place to read and to better himself and to give him the most opportunity and head start uh, in this country when he needed it the most. Um, and so he started to create all of these libraries and all these beautiful works and especially giving a lot of money to art institutions and artistic schools like the Carnegie Hall, right? The very famous one. Uh, and so a true testament, right? The Germans. So let us look at the Germans. If anyone has ever been to Pennsylvania, Germans galore, right? Uh, William Penn, our very favorite Quaker, uh, was inviting 
many German Quakers to settle in Pennsylvania, where they had settled, because he promised them very cheap land and, most importantly, religious freedom, because Europe was not the best at religious freedom at that time. And so in the 1680s to the 1700s, thousands and thousands were making the journey from Europe towards Pennsylvania. By the time of the uh, American Revolution in 76, we had nearly a quarter of a million people of German descent living in the colonies and nearby. Now, the Germans themselves, as true as they are from this day, they are still, they are still so in the modern day and the present. Uh, they were highly productive, clean, profitable, and built everything with care. And so the German farms that they produced in Pennsylvania were one of the best, right? So profitable, so productive, uh, they truly made a name for themselves. And here we see a certain amount of acculturation. Now, we uh, discussed this a little bit earlier, but it is good to repeat it. So we've discussed assimilation before where assimilation, A-S-S, -S, assimilation, is whenever a group of individuals comes to the home country and the home country tells you, you must forego your language, your culture, your beliefs, and you have to accept and believe ours now, right? So for instance, if you are, I don't know, just out of random, let's say you are French, and you were coming to the United States. You must speak English now. You must have all your customs to be English. You will become, uh, you will become Americanized, essentially, right? And so, acculturation here, ACC, is different because it is a mutual exchange of ideas and culture. And so, some aspects will be Americanized, but they will also. Uh, give back a little bit and so not entirely all of your culture will be eradicated or, des or destroyed some of it is going to kind of intermesh and so uh, the Germans did not necessarily acculturate easily because once again your historic past influences your cultural present I need to coin that phrase of mine but the reason that they could not acculturate so easily and they really held on to their roots and their beliefs is because at that time, Germany and all of those surrounding German lands in Europe were independent principalities. What does that mean? That means that they were living in kind of smaller, isolated political groups. Uh, and so they had no real sense of a national identity at that time. There was no sense of we are all German uh, because they were all broken up into different principalities, right? Um, I believe I have, yeah, so there's a map here. Just look at how many differing principalities there were. So if you were within any one of these different principalities, you thought yourself and you considered yourself part of that region, but there was still no overall overarching sense of we are all German. And so the fact that they were pushing back against this uh, kind of overarching narrative of like, you should Americanize yourself and be part of this larger national sense of the word, they did not have anything to base that off of. And so for them, it was a little bit more difficult to acculturate. And we have a wonderful quote from Benjamin Franklin himself in 1753 about the Germans coming over en masse for settlement. He says, and I quote, why should the Pal Palatine Boers be suffered to swarm into our settlements and by herding together establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours? Why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them? End quote. So, interesting on a number of levels. Number one, he uses them in terms of calling them aliens, right? So they are foreign, they're foreigners who are entering into this country. And the very last sentence is interesting to me, that he believes they 
because of their large numbers, will Germanize us instead of us anglifying them. So that is a typical nativist reaction because the natives of the home country are fearful that the immigrants will come in and change things up for, I guess, the worse. They will change the culture, change the language, change the narrative, where in their minds, it should be the opposite, right? So if the immigrants come to the country, they are the ones that should acquiesce and pick up all of these different distinctions instead of the other way around. Now, the Germans part two. So some, uh, some similar thoughts. Uh, and so this great migration that the Germans had from Europe towards uh, the Americas at this time, uh, especially the 1800s, which was an enormous time for the U.S. for, uh, you know, migration waves. Uh, there was certain reasons why the Germans left. And I'll break it down into three. Revolution, economics, and political divide. And so as far as revolution goes, between 1820 and 1920s, more than 5.7 million people immigrated from Germany. This was caused by political problems due to the Vienna Revolution that caused peasants to uprise because they demanded more liberal reforms in their lives and those independent principalities that you and I were talking about earlier. And so conservatives, the leaders of those independent principalities and the princes, uh, they ended up brutally suppressing them with military force, having tens of thousands slaughtered and killed in the streets uh, to suppress any possible idea of liberal reforms or governmental changes or reforms. And so obviously, if you're a German in this period of time and in these type of areas, you're thinking to yourself, really, do I want to stay here? And then you're reading your newspaper and you're like, America is so great and there's plenty of land and religious freedom here. You're like, maybe I should change my mind. <laughs> uh, second reason, economics. The population was increasing more and more and life was becoming more difficult for the peasants, especially with buying food and earning decent wages at factories. And so just from economic standpoint, right? Uh, the value of the currency was not worth as much. There's higher population numbers. It was more difficult for you to have a good life. And so many were fleeing to America, but they had excellent skills that they brought over. Some of them were experts in mining, metallurgy, right? Or uh, being experts with manipulating metals such as blacksmith, goldsmith, jewelers, etc., textiles, cobblers, construction, leather workers, cabinet makers, whatever. They brought forth their skills, whatever it was, and they made it work here. Political divide. Many Germans, like we said earlier, did not see or did not have national loyalties at this time. And so, you know, they did have some regional differences, right? Uh, within the kind of Germanic realms in Europe. But, you know, the fact that they did not have that overarching, uh, you know, conception of all of Germany and we're all Germans made ethnic, made a acculturation or assimilation much more difficult for them to stomach. And so, you know, as German Americans began to expand and grow and as their children of all these immigrants and grandchildren started to go through the system of America, uh, we started to see, obviously, you know, the slow uh, but sure acculturation and eventual sim uh, assimilation of these individuals. So even now, if you go to Pennsylvania or anywhere else in America, if you find a blonde, blue-eyed individual, uh, let's say they say, oh, I am of German ancestry. But then you ask them to speak German. They'll be like, oh, well, my grandpa knew German. Uh, I don't know any German, right? All I know is English. So the assimilation is kind of continued and won out of the day due to the generational gap. Uh, and so here we see on the left-hand side a picture of a typical German family that would be, uh, you know, moving 
and trying to gain access through some of the uh, ports and railroad stations uh, at the time, right? Them and their family seeking a better life. But once again, I love to dis uh, dispel this overarching narrative. Uh, and it goes both ways, obviously, right? But it seems that America has never been too good with immigrants and new people. No matter what ethnic background, race, or whoever it's been, uh, if you come to the United States on mass in large enough numbers, apparently there is enough uh, nativist backlash, right, to house and harbor some resentment against you. So on the right hand side here, it is a very, uh, very insidious political drawing. So in the background, we have a city or village burning, which means that this individual on the left, the German slash Prussian dressed individual with blood on his hands, showing that he just uh, essentially raped and pillaged his way through the village. He is being hung at the neck, right, or drawn by the neck by this figure, which looks like Uncle Sam, right, the very quintessential figure of, let's say, America. And he is about to throw the rope up onto the tree and essentially lynch him and hang him. And so even these Germans, these white uh, Germans, are being prejudiced against because they are coming in such large numbers to the states. And so I would factor this as large nativist reactions, right? Even going all the way as far as uh, World War One, or getting closer to World War One, we even see folks here, uh, and you know, our sailors and members of the armed forces, uh, you know, still kind of uh, making fun and playing at the Germans and the Prussians, uh, and so that racial, the ethnic kind of tensions, right, really do um, stay alive, right, and they come to play time and time again over the decades. It does not change. Uh, and unfortunately for the Germans, uh, World War I did nothing for the reputation, nothing helpful. World War II under Hitler definitely did not help anyone. And so even in the modern times and context, for any of you, uh, you know, video gamers, right? I like to play some games once in a while too. I recently just downloaded Battlefield V, right? And so there's a World War II based game. But every single time we have any type of, you know, video game going back into the 20th century, the Nazis and the Germans are always the bad guys. Uh, so it's a typical trope that still is alive today, right? The Dutch. You know what I always think about whenever I hear the Dutch? I don't know if any of you, some of you might be too young for this to remember, but... Uh, if anyone remembers watching the Austin Powers series, uh, for whatever reason, the the dad of Austin Powers, whenever he was remembering the English interactions with the Dutch, uh, he would always tell his son Austin Powers, right, something about the Dutch. And the way he would say it was just hilarious to me. He's like, and let's not forget that England shares a border with the Dutch, right? <laughs> he would just say it with such disdain. And I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, so the Dutch. The Dutch were famous for one main thing, money. Their main driving force during these centuries was the creation and expansion and large profitability of the Dutch West India Company. Now, this company comprised of many merchants and investors and was essentially established to trade with India, right? And in the Indian Ocean, hence the West India uh, Company. But they became so powerful over time and so wealthy that they started to rival all of uh, the native host country of theirs, uh, of, you know, Denmark. So they, you know, were able to amass private armies their financial influence was powerful. And as soon as people started to start settling in the Americas, 
especially North America. They wanted a piece of the slice of pie, right? They wanted a piece of the action. So they wanted to plant a colony here. And so they ended up landing near Manhattan Island um, and renaming it New Netherland, right? And so New Netherland, right, on Manhattan Island, present day, was the entry for thousands of Dutch farmers to come in during the 1700s, nearly 100 plus thousand. During the Great Migration of the 1800s, more than a quarter million of them ended up immigrating here too. And some reasons for them immigrating. Once again, religion plays a huge factor and role. So in 1840, King William I controlled the Dutch Reformed Church and started to supervise meetings, jail ministers, and arrest parishioners. And so many were fleeing religious persecution towards America because America was at least at this point in time, right? Especially compared with the rest of the world, guaranteeing some type of religious freedom. And so for them, it was better than what they had. And the second was economic reasons. Uh, following the colonial Dutch uh, phases, um, they began to purchase uh, a lot of quote-unquote poor land here, right, in North America, and especially near that area of Manhattan. And once they started to purchase this poor land uh, at the low prices, they began to convert it with all of their skills and knowledge base into rich slash profitable land. So they're essentially trying to flip property here. Not a bad choice, not a bad investment, right? If I have to say so. Now, the New Netherlands were also a ripe area for the Dutch to get into the fur game. And so, you know, early on before they started to uh, really cultivate, you know, large cities, uh, we can attribute some of their early expansion and exploration to Mr. Uh, Peter Stu. Uh, and so he began to, you know, establish the original fur trading posts here for the Dutch India companies uh, and starting to create all of this commerce. Uh, and New Amsterdam was a city that they had built uh, on Manhattan Island, we were just talking about. Uh, but later, this big and profitable city that was at the center of all the fur trade uh, was renamed to New York City after the Duke of York because the Brits had come in uh, and conquered the region for a period of time. So it was renamed New York City. But some early remnants of the Dutch influence can be seen. So of New Netherlands, or excuse me, New Amsterdam, within this general landscape of New Netherlands, this is an old map detailing what is modern-day New York City, the tip of it. Uh, and so we have a star fort uh, on the edge with some of the uh, windmills. Uh, and we have this enormous right kind of settlement here. And we have a giant wall on the right hand side to uh, push back any potential invaders or Native American raids and excursions. Uh, and so, you know, they were obviously uh, being very profitable, having these trading posts uh, and, you know, just increasing the amount of global power and connections and commercial trade that they had, um, even going as far as um, dipping their toes into the slave trade that eventually we were going to discuss in much closer detail during our African-American sections uh, and establishing shops, right, stores, goods, etc. Um, this is an interesting mural that still exists today in the subways of New York City. Uh, and so this details, right, we have this large sort of wall and the city in the background of the landscape. And so this details uh, Wall Street. The reason it is called Wall Street today is because Wall Street today runs alongside that giant fortified eastern wall that you see on the map here today. So very interesting that some modern 
uh, street names, right? Have all of this ancient kind of, not ancient, but all of this old kind of historical uh, ties and backgrounds to it. All right, Scandinavians and the French, and then it's almost done, folks. So the Scandinavians, between 1820 and 1824, approximately a century of migration waves, uh, we had more than a more than th three fourths of a million Norwegians, right, coming to um, the Americas, uh, and so many of these migrations, uh, you know, had very shared common perspective within the Scandinavian uh, Northern European. Uh, countries and so they were a very stoic people and they could endure much pain and hardship without the display of too much uh, kind of uh, outward feeling without complaints uh, and they were also very morally flexible uh, they proved to be very strong on many of their virtues and incredibly resilient to economic change and turbulence uh, and so the reason for this is because um, during this period of time, they had the wonderful after effect of being the inheritors of the Enlightenment, and many of their uh, many of their intellectuals and the people themselves were the inheritors of reading all of this Enlightenment thoughts, and so they became the culture itself became a little more stoic, right, more philosophical in nature. Um, and so they were being a little bit more uh, reserved, right? Uh, and in addition to that, geographically speaking, they were at the crossroads between West and Eastern Europe uh, and Central Europe, for that matter. And so the fact that they had to retain themselves and their culture and kind of be a little more distant towards foreigners and others um, also lent some advice here. I remember that when I was in my undergraduate at UCLA, um, I was attending a wonderful seminar. My one of my classes towards towards the end of my degree was having a wonderful seminar with the emeritus professor, and I had a uh, I had a Norwegian and a Swede in my class. Great intellectual guys, loved their coffee, um, but they were a little reserved, and so they were explaining to me. They're like, "Yeah, if you go through our countries, uh, most people would not really." want to be friends with you right off the bat, you have to warm up to them, or excuse me, they have to warm up to you. Uh, and usually, usually they like to sit down over a cup of coffee. And that's how you start getting an in, right. And so he's like, Yeah, we're very, you know, we're very kind of independent people, we love to read, we love to be cultured, etc, go to school, but it takes them a little bit of time, right. Um, obviously, that's not going to be completely representative of every single individual, but at least that's what I got from the source. And so here we can divide the experiences of many of the Scandinavians um, before and after the 1880s, right, kind of being a dividing mark. So pre 1880s, most of them immigrated for economic reasons, because many of them were trying to find uh, farmland. Now, the Scandinavian countries are not fantastic for farming. We are not talking about Spain or southern France or southern Italy. Uh, the ge geography here is that the soil is merely too moist. The geographical location many times is too rocky and mountainous. And the winters are so harsh it would kill many other plants. And so it was very unsuitable for a large scale farming. And so pre 1880s, farming was the name of the game. Go elsewhere and find land. Post 1880s, increasingly, most of them started to immigrate with specialized work on their minds. So they had experience already as painters, masons, carpenters, iron steel workers, industrial workers, etc. So benefiting from the industrial revolution and all of the advanced work and education that that provided to them they used that and transplanted it into the uh, system here and many of you and your families or your grandparents or aunts and uncles or whoever 
might relate to this, whether they were specialists in their home countries, no matter where it was, whether they were doctors, engineers, um, or, I don't know, they were expert jewelry, ma jewelry makers, right? Something. Uh, you can hopefully transplant those skills and use them here. Uh, and so that is exactly what they started to do. And we can break it up even further, right? Kind of differentiating between the Finns, the Norwegians, the Danes, the Swedes, uh, and get into more of a kind of minute detailed focus. Uh, obviously, this is not going to be an end-all be-all analysis onto every single right kind of group. But in general, we can, you know, we can see an overall and I'm looking towards the bottom of my slide here, but we're looking towards a general kind of, you know, national identity sense that we are going to be getting, right? Um, that these individuals, you know, some, some are more isolated of a culture like the Finns and Norwegians. The Danes and the Swedes end up being more of an open culture background, right, for various reasons, but uh, Finland and, you know, others, uh, you know, were, I think the Finns are a perfect example of the national identity because for centuries they had to fight wars against the Swedish and also against the Russians. And so because of this and because of Russification, where Russia was trying to just hammer down forced assimilation, uh, once again, your historical past influences your cultural present. And they had a strong yearning to be independent and to have a strong national identity, which whenever they're coming over to the, the states is going to make it more difficult for them to fully uh, acculturate, right, or assimilate uh, over time. And so, yeah, we can make a gen some general as you know, assertions about all of these various different groups. Uh, and, you know, depending on their circumstance, depending on the histories of the particular peoples, right, and their, uh, their uh, countries, uh, and what kind of political, economic and social reasons they had for potentially moving, it really does make sense why some of them were having, let's say, an easier time acculturating and why some of them were having slightly more difficult one. Uh, and so, like we said earlier, farming and gaining farmland was the name of the game at this point in time. It was the best way for you to gain meaningful employment, land, opportunity, wealth. And it was uh, seen as a great economic start to your life, right? Especially because at the time, the United States was just giving, essentially giving out free land to all of these uh, immigrants coming over. But we'll speak more of that in future chapters. Last but not least, the French. So, uh, in, this, in the 1600s, the 17th century quiz, uh, King Louis XIV was launching various persecutions, prohibiting Protestant services, closing chapels, burning publications, confiscating property, uh, depending it on the circumstance and who he did not like. And so, Many folks were being muscled out by this king, the godson king, this huge and powerful uh, monarch, right, who's ruling with an absolute fist. And so many started to flee America because they were educated, they were ambitious, they were skilled, but most importantly, they also wanted religious freedom that America offered. And so they came over here to work, and very quickly, their children were learning English, intermarrying within the colonists, and forming strong kinship bonds and systems. Uh, and so by the 18th century, many of these French found themselves in the frontiers, right, of the Western Front of the colonies uh, and the early states and became frontiersmen. So they were excellent at becoming fishermen, fur trappers, cattle herders, cotton farmers. Um, you know, they loved living on sort of the edge. And more and more of them kept migrating over due to instability in Europe, French Revolution, the Napoleon Wars, 
Uh, and so all of this kind of hardship that they had to endure within Europe was the catalyst for them to get pushed out and move to a better place, right, toward America. And so hardship by tradition. Many of these old uh, French farming techniques that they had were depleting their uh, soil and their farms. Uh, and because of the old school inheritance system that they held from the French culture, where whenever you are going to die, you must divide the lands to all of your remaining children. Now, that's not great because as time goes on, the various amounts of land you're giving towards all of your children get smaller and smaller and smaller, and hence the land becomes worthless. And so because they were kind of strangled by the, their traditions from France in, in terms of farming, uh, many of them found it difficult to remain in the farming uh, trade and land trade. So most of them started to migrate closer towards becoming merchants, frontiersmen, working, uh, you know, working uh, in a different capacity other than land. Because at least there, if you're a fur, uh, a fur trapper, a fisherman, etc., uh, there's nothing for you to give off to your children, right? You're working hard, you're establishing maybe by a house or maybe a business down the road, but that's it. Uh, and so, at least for farming, they found it a bit difficult amongst themselves. And so you can just imagine all of the early uh, French fur trappers, right? Uh, which was an enormously lucrative uh, endeavor, right? Especially in Europe, because the Europeans, uh, many of those countries uh, undergo terrible snowfall and frigid uh, conditions. Uh, fur was highly, highly valued. Now, if you have a few minutes of time, this is a general recap of European migration, uh, kind of detailing some of the reasons Europeans were coming over here, how they migrated here uh, on various ferries and ships and going through ports and settlements. Uh, and it kind of wraps up all of our various discussions, right, very nicely. So if you have a few minutes, please watch this video uh, and hopefully it'll wrap up this uh, chapter nicely for you. Uh, but with that, that is the end of chapter two. Uh, do not forget to keep up with the readings, uh, the lectures, uh, our weekly discussion questions. We are going to have a check-in assignment uh, due on Thursday. Uh, and we are going to have discussion questions due uh, by Sunday. So please stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, thank you for being here for lecture. If there are any questions, please feel free to email me via Canvas or if you want a 1v1 Zoom session. Uh, I might be, uh, for the first week, just hosting a general kind of Q&A Zoom session, a non-mandatory Zoom session, uh, just to kind of say hi to everybody. So um, if anything, I'll post up a video on that um, on Canvas and kind of let everyone know what day and time it's going to be. But either way, thank you so much for being here, for taking the time to listen. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I will see you later for Chapter 3. Take care, everyone.